Washington than you would think. Please, Philadelphia Flyers podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Collington, and uh, joining me this morning, I think you already have some suspicions as to who it might be. <laughs> it is the one, the only, he's at Kevin underscore Durso on Twitter. It's Kevin Durso. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Kyle? I'm doing all right. I figured uh, the team lost last night, right? We're, we're right. recording this on Sunday morning in our normal Sunday morning re- recording spot. Team lost. We're a little tiny bit down on the team at the moment, so I wanted sure. to come in with a little bit of a punched up intro for you. Uh, and I, I did mention that you can find Kevin on Twitter at Kevin underscore Darso. And while we're here, uh, the show's over there at YWT Podcast. Mm-hmm. Make sure you check out here. make sure you check out all our uh, Sports Talk Philly connections too. We're at Sports Talk PHL on Twitter, as well as at Flyer Delphia on game days. And also, you can find our show everywhere including twitter facebook blah 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 as well as sportstalkphilly.com yep all right so we're getting into it and uh a little bit of a pull back the curtain moment here uh this episode is gonna come out on our in our normal time slot on sunday night you will probably be listening to this after game four uh we are recording at game four so you know or beforehand so you know just kind of keep that in mind as we go throughout the show today for all the right right reasons we got thrown for a loop with the schedule change. Definitely. I mean, all the right reasons to not have played games over the course of the two days. That being said, we got thrown for a loop because we sat there looked at when they revised we the schedule. We had the schedule perfect. Well, we, and had, we days, had the perfect schedule for recording, right? Because yeah, we had and Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday, boom, we record the show Sunday. It's perfect. We, and we said last week, we teased it. We said, oh, what's it going to be after four games? We even teased it. And yep. now... We're, we're sitting here talking about a 2-1 well, series. Now we're in a weird spot because of the fact that we're in a, in, in a spot where we're telling people, you're probably listening after game four, but yep. we're going to be talking about three games and we have no idea what game four is going to look like. But that being said, I mean, yeah, it did throw us off a little bit because we looked after, after that revised schedule came out, after we stepped back and took the time like everybody else hopefully did with no sports on for a couple of days, but whatever. You know, like I know there's mixed opinions on it. I've watched on we're Twitter. Just, I took a social on. media we're break just, for a couple of days. We're just blowing through it. Yeah. I took a couple <laughs> days of social media break, so I understand it. Regardless, we're looking at the new schedule. Well, we looked at the new schedule and we're like, okay, so what do we do? Game on Saturday night, game on Sunday night. And we typically record on Sundays and we didn't want to jump in. I don't think any of us felt like moving I'm things not, up either. Like, no. We up, because it didn't work that way either. Because then we would have been recording Saturday morning for a Saturday night game that everybody would have watched. So just bad by the time you listened so the we kind of we kind of got hosed by the schedule change uh is we decided like we said to just kind of blow through game four and we're just gonna miss it and we'll have to talk about it next week and exactly next week we'll be talking about the rest of the series and that's exactly where i was about to go game four is the hinge but but by next week especially by the time we record in our normal slot sunday mornings we post sunday night we'll know a result of the series, no matter how you swing. We will know like, who is in the Eastern Conference Finals. Yeah, we'll know everything. We, decide. we will know yeah. who the Final Four are. We, are no, we will know what NHL teams will be going to the bubble in Edmonton to break yeah. down for the Conference Finals and Stanley Cup Final. Like, we're here. We're yeah. there. And, we'll we'll see, and we will be ready to talk about it no matter what the, what the outcome is. And like you said, I think you made a very fair point. This, we're might, a little, be, this might be our last podcast of the Philadelphia Flyer season. It might be. And That's a possibility. It is a possibility. And it's a possibility because the series is going to be over before the next time we're on. <laughs> right, regardless of how way. it ends. If it I goes mean, to regardless seven, of it's how it ends. Are, I mean, it can still know. go to seven games. And, you know, I, 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 we talked when we talked last week, when we did the show last week, and we, you said tr- as confidently as you could that you thought it was going to be 3 1 after four games. And I, <laughs> and I said 2 2. So I'm still on the table with this. As we're sitting here, I'm still waiting. You know, I'm still holding out for that two-two. Well, listen, I, I, I really thought it was going to go. I think it's going seven. And that's my fault for assuming that the team was going to show up in all the games. Uh, you know, I figured they might get a three-one series lead if if they actually decide to show up <laughs> for all four hockey games. And I, I know they only played three, but <laughs> out of the nine periods played, mm-hmm. uh, I'm sorry, ten periods played. <laughs> how many did the Flyers show up for? Three. Four? I mean, if we if we want to categorize it as ten, then uh, nine and a half. Then I'd say then I'd say three safely. Yeah, or two and a half, two and, and a half. Right, and one of them is that half little overtime period where they actually looked pretty good. Yeah, well, I'm counting I'm counting the overtime as a full, so I'm saying they showed up for one really good period, maybe right. half of another, and overtime. And the only reason they got the opportunity to look that good in overtime is because they blew because a three goal lead. 
Well, it, and it's also because it's only, I think it's only because they had a really strong first period because let's say they don't score three goals. They lose. They lose 3-1 like they've lost the other games right. in this series. Then like, we're done here. We're sitting here talking about 3-0 Islanders. Honestly, if, that, if that's how close it is to the other way around, to be honest. Yeah, I don't think he's going to get it. But Barry Trott should win the Jack Adams. Because well, this Islanders team is no, not well, this good. Well, he's not going to get it because he's not a finalist. So I know. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but he should. Yeah, he's I mean, he's really good, obviously. And but he's he. This Islanders team is not a skilled team. The, relatively speaking. Right, well, right. I, I was going to say, I, I understand that this team has skill. Matthew Barzell is very skilled. Anders Lee is a hockey player, I guess. Um, they have some good, talented players, but. Your top pair is Pelic Pulak, which, by the way, is the worst pairing t- in the league, just by name alone. Uh-huh. Okay, by name. Pelic and they've, Pulak. They've the announcers good. must hate it. Uh-huh. Uh, no, but, but that's otherwise... your top pair, and that's just not – that is not an elite top pair, and I don't think I'm, I'm breaking any windows by saying that. No, you know, what, you know what you're saying by saying stuff like that? This is not a sexy team on paper. It's not. Unless you but look they... at Matt Barzell. Well, even Barzil. All right, so let's 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 do something. Because I went to go look. I wanted to look for comparison's sake. Because I'm sitting here, as I'm sitting here, trying to figure out. Because we have a, we have a clear talking point to this series so far, and it's pretty much been the story of game one, then two, then three in the progression. Which is game one. Where is everybody? Particularly the top six. Yeah. Game two. Look who showed up with authority. Here's Kevin Hayes. Two goals in the first ten minutes. Here's Sean Couturier making Nick Letty look awful. You know, no, as he and, should. And, yeah, but nonetheless, but really taking it to like in a one on one situation, he does not have to make a power move. He could try to play conservatively there, just try to wait for help. No, he, you know, he pushed. Whatever. He was aggressive. He pushed, he went took for it, it to the net, went for it, and scored a goal that ended up being as meaningful as any of them because right. the third one that you needed to, you like know, you said, right? They so, needed every one of those goals to give him the chance so, to play the good over. So I sit there and, and so I sit there and I go, that's the story of game two. You got those guys to show up. And realistically, that's the line that was on the ice for you in overtime that yep. got it done. You know, Couturier is out there going to the net, making things happen. Giroux made things happen in that overtime. No question about it. Myers is the guy who gets the goal, but they're, they're the line of forwards on the ice that kept the pressure on, didn't allow the Islanders to get out of their zone, and they, they win the game off of that. And then game three, we're doing the same thing. Where are these guys? And that's the story. Now, I looked for comparison's sake, and I went, all right, how much better? How, like, were some of these Islanders players that much better in the regular season that maybe we can sit there and draw something to that, like they, that they had more points, something like, because we know that the Flyers were not a top heavy team in point totals. No, like, they were they, very, they defended, very spread out. Right. Well, not only that, but they were defend, they, they defended well and had a few guys who right. had 50 or 60. And then you go, all right, that's where it lies. And there was no top end guy. Did the Islanders have that? And I went and I go, look, and the Islanders top scorer this year was Barzell, 19 goals, 60 points. That's it. You know, and then the next guy in line is 54, then two 43s and a 40. And just just a little, little good. tiny bit of a, an asterisk saying this was only a 70-ish game season. Uh, uh, true. Because we're throwing these points out like 55 and 60, and, and in your head you're thinking of a full 82-game season, and you're like, oh, that's a little lackluster. I you realize it, it's still below point per game, but it's a little closer when you consider 60 points in 70 games is, is pretty good. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not saying that. What I'm, but I'm, no, I know. I know. I just wanted to make sure that the little mental math for everyone, it's oh, not sure. a full 82-game season. But for comparison's sake – Travis Konechny had 61 and 66. Yeah, for sure. And Sean Couturier had 59 and 69 games. You know, like these – Nice. Yeah. So these guys have played almost – it's, it's the same number of games just about, and it's the same point structure. There's yeah, not a guy sure. who's, who's over the top. There's not a guy who's a clear-cut superstar player by the point totals. And there was room to go up with more games. If they finish out the 82-game season, Konechny wasn't going to because he missed three games with the concussion. Right. But, all right, so Konechny finishes at 79 games. And what would he have finished at? Would he have pushed 79 points, 80 points? Quite possibly. If yeah, he, he, very, he going, very possibly he could have been in the 75 range. Point per game. I yeah. mean, he was five points away from that. And Couturier, yep. especially the way he was going at that time. Oh, yeah. He, could pu- he was pulling three-point nights out whenever he, he wanted. He was on his way to potentially yet another 75-point season yep. in 82 games. Sean Couturier and, has and been remarkably consistent. Yeah. 
And nobody would have had a problem with that, especially when you consider the number of goals allowed that the team had and how it went down over the course of the year. Like the Flyers allowed way fewer goals in the regular season this year. And obviously I get it. There was extra games to be played, but they allowed way fewer and were on pace to allow way fewer than they had the year before. Yeah. Goals per game that, was down. Yeah. And call that better defensive play, call that stable goaltending. And, call and that all of that is true, forwards. by the way. If you look at the defensive core now, it's better than yeah. it's been in the last three decades. Yeah. When's the last time the Flyers defensive core top to bottom was this good? Yeah, it's been a while. Real for question sure. for the fans out there. Tweet us at, on Twitter at YWT podcast. When is the last time the Flyers defensive core one through six, even including your, your spare has been this good. I would love to hear it legitimately. Right. Uh, and, and I'm not trying to say like, you look at that like, and the fact that you have Carter Hart who put up spectacular numbers, especially at home. Right. And yeah, it makes sense that the team is allowing fewer goals. That all makes sense. Bring, you add in the fact that Elaine Vino has put in a great system. Right. That's, that's why the Philadelphia Flyers were a top five team in the league this year. And the key to the system is, is this, especially in a series like this. I don't think there's – and, and I'm, I, I will go on the record to saying this on the show. You've made some bold predictions. I, 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 like, look – any and, and but when you're down to oh, eight, I'll make a bold prediction later. Don't you worry. When we're when you're down to eight teams left in a league, anybody can win. That's obvious. I mean, there's only everybody's eight good. Everybody's, nobody's here because they're locked. Right. Nobody's here because they're a bad team. Right. That being said, even though Montreal look, tried, you might look at the style of these two teams in particular, the Flyers and the Islanders, and the way they've played throughout, and the way that they've had to play throughout the playoffs, and think that this is not sustainable throughout an entire playoff run. You can't play, and I think the Flyers are kind of proving it to an extent because you played one series like this, now you're playing another, and your half of your playoff run is going to be tight checking, limited space, good luck trying to, to, to get around this team because they put up the wall and don't let you get through. Although and it, is, especially starting, when they it leave. is starting to look like the next round might be a little more wide open playing Tampa. But that's but, where I'm going with this. I don't know of another team in the playoffs that's left that looks like the Islanders do. I don't. I can't find one in the West, and I can't find one in the other. I'd like in the other series. If Vegas doesn't look that far off, but Vegas looks beatable at times more so That's than true. the Islanders have. I mean, the Islanders look like the more unbeatable team than Vegas does at times because of the way they lock it. Well, down. I just mean stylistically. I think Vegas is the Vegas only team that comes anywhere near what the Islanders are doing. And yet, and yet, I'd argue the Islanders probably are getting the better goaltending than Vegas is. Even, you know, lander has been good. I'm not saying lander has been bad. I just, on paper, again, I don't see him being the guy, especially... If only if only Vegas had another goalie. Oh, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do I they know. have somebody they could turn to if they pull Laner? Yeah. No, yeah. that guy's got a knife in his back. It's fine. <laughs> We're not going to go into that. We missed that that story completely. Well, well, we're not going into that one because that one pissed off Mark Andre Fleury. Yeah. You know, he wasn't thrilled with that either. You know, so I, and I don't blame him for that. You know, I don't think you need that, you know, nonetheless. But the, like, and as I'm watching that game, like, I watched the game last night with a couple of friends. And as we're watching, you know, the discussion was boy, boy, it looks like Tampa's year, doesn't it? Like Tampa looks really good. How many times have we said year. that? Now we've said that, and I understand we've said it a lot, but now everybody. We said that last year when they were up three nothing over the Columbus every, Blue Jackets in game one. That's true. But everyone was watching that game going, oh, this is it. They're up three yeah, one. Now, this is their year. But now I think it's different because of the fact that they won that first round series. And after winning the first round series, they're up three one on, Bo- on Boston. They're Washington after they finally beat Pittsburgh in the second round. But they're, up they're, they're over the hump. But they're up three one on Boston. Yeah. And look like, and making it look like Boston had no shot in the series to begin with. So yeah, Boston's been Boston gooned it up a little bit on. And Saturday. Boston won Game One. Let's let's remember that too. Boston won Game One, and, and Tampa's then ripped off. Really the didn't look like that, to, you know. After that, so I know where I get where that's coming from, and I turn around Man. my res- but but my response is like, sure. Does it look like Tampa's year? Possibly, sure. But my response is, I'm telling you, this Islanders team could go really far. And close to all the way with this type of style because teams are not prepared. I, I don't think teams are prepared to play like this when they've had four months off. Well, I wonder how much that changes when Tampa looks like they might have five days to drill that. Well, true. And, and, I, I, when, I and especially, I and especially when you consider they, they're Tampa – if Tampa takes care of Boston right now, we're as we're recording this, they're up three uh, one. I believe they play game five tomorrow night. Tampa might have a week off if you if 
Philly, to, if yeah. Philly, New York goes long, and then everyone has to go to Edmonton and re go through quarantine protocols, at least well, to some is, to some extent. This is an interesting point because uh, let's say that that happens. Let's say Tampa's got like, time to get tape and practice. But here's something else to consider. Let's say that happens. Let's say Tampa wins Game Five, series is over. They're into the conference final. Is that much time off good? Well, not not just about that much time off, but can they even start their trip to Edmonton earlier? Hey, we oh, and we're done. Through, and go we're through done. quarantine protocols. Let's just, let's just travel tomorrow. They might, wait, they might want to wait until teams, Western Conference teams are out of Edmonton before they put more teams in Possibly, teams and I wonder, I'm just wondering if the league has a plan that says you're stuck in Toronto even if your series is over until everything's done and we it know what two are moving. It wouldn't surprise me if they're flying everybody over on as few flights as possible and, and keeping everything be- super tight. True. I still think it would be two flights nonetheless, but like, hey, this team and this team, but. Well, yeah, but there might be. But I'm wondering if they do it all. There might be three flights. It might be uh, the Flyers, because I'm optimistic. Uh, (laughs) Tampa on the other flight. And then the third flight is for staff and gear. Well, staff and and officials, and yes. Um, So I'm I'm curious if if Tampa is going to have to wait. I'm wondering. I'm just wondering if there's a protocol like like what they did to get them to Toronto. And it's also a little bit of an place. advantage in terms of time zones if well, they sure. go over early. So right, but that's but that's what I'm saying. Like they did this to get there originally, but it was one day. Everybody was arriving on the same day. It right. was just staggered. So like the Flyers got there. It was one o'clock in the afternoon. They were the first ones to show up. But then everybody showed up periodically after that throughout like, the, in day, the same yeah. day. So maybe they'll just wait for that. I don't know. But it, it, I just wondered if it plays into it because what if you got them into the hotel in Edmonton earlier than everybody I, else and they spend five days doing what they have to do and then the other team has to show time, right? Well, well and then they, well, See, they, they spend the next, they spend the next couple of days going through quarantine protocols while the Flyers and Islanders wrap up their series. And then while the Flyers slash Islanders are going through quarantine protocols, Tampa's got time to practice, and now they know who they're playing. Well, yeah, and you know what? So th- there's got to be a competitive advantage there. There has so to be. So th- I think they have to keep – for the integrity of the whole thing, you have to keep this team stuck there. So and I granted, think you got to shut they, that you know, down. Do yeah. they get extra practice time? Possibly. Maybe Absolutely. Let them, use, let, the, let them use the rink. And they deserve you know, that. You know what? They, they stay on the ice and practice for these days until this series is over. But after that, you're, everybody's going on a plane and flying to Edmonton at the same time. That is an advantage that you have every single year. If you sweep your series and your opponent goes to seven, you get that benefit every year. That just exists always. So why not now? Yeah. You might as well just give it to them. Uh, yeah, this, but, isn't the, this isn't the NBA where, like, when the series is over. Like, the NBA has a second-round series already known, so they just start it. Yeah, that's As weird. opposed to – Hey, I like first that for the record. Going, it, I like it for, for, um, for brevity. Like it moves yeah. it faster. But and like, for them, it's a little different because everyone's in the same bubble. But I, like we talked about, there are logistical challenges to breaking two bubbles down to one. And we're now at that point. So we're, we're talking about, you know, is Tampa going to be stuck in Toronto for a couple of days? And I, I personally think they should be, and they should break it all down at once. And everyone should go to the West coast at once. And I mean, Honestly, their time zones really don't have to change too much, right? They're going to play in the early slot. Yeah, they're not going to. For, t- for television purposes. Not too much is going to change. I no. Mean, it's it, it's going to come down to, I mean, you're going to have to, the only thing that's going to get weird, I mean, actually, I don't think there's, that there's really much change. Like, you're talking about an early time slot. I think they're just going to stagger the games by days. Oh, you're right. Every, like, every game is just going to be like, at 8.30 or whatever. Or 8 o'clock or something like that. Like, I, I just don't think you can. I think, I think it'll be national coverage starts at 8, puck well, drop around 8.20. Yeah, exactly. So that way but you get 5.20 on the West Coast and people have, time, you know, a chance to get out of work. Uh, but, know. yeah, so uh, let's talk. I, I know it's going to be a little uh, out of date by the time the show goes live, but right. real quick. Uh, we had a little bit of a conversation in the group text between last night and this morning mm-hmm. uh, about what I missed what, a whole lot of it because yeah. I, it happened earlier in the morning than I was prepared <laughs> to be ready for it, so. which is fine. Uh, <laughs> but this conversation regarded around what, if any, lineup changes the Flyers should make in Game Four and for the rest of the series. And you know, again, we're recording this Sunday morning, so we don't know. Kevin, if if you're Elaine Vino and you're filling out your lineup card today. What, what's different? What changes are you making? How? I, I've asked you this once before. Yeah. 
and and we're back at it. You've asked me this with the with the common known line for people who cover the team that go, I don't make the lineup, so don't at me about it right. because I'm not the constructor of the lineup. I'm just telling you what I know. But let's say Elaine Vigneault hands you that pen and the uh, the empty lineup sheet. Are you making any radical changes here? Is is Shane Gostaspear coming in? Is uh, Morgan Frost coming in? That's something that uh, producer Mike wants because he's an idiot. But um, um, what are you doing? What are you doing if you're making this lineup today? I got to say the, um, the I don't make the lineup thing, it really helps right now because nobody knows anything until warmups anyway. So it's right, like, we don't see anything. It just comes right. out there and all we can do is say something. And even so, at warmups, we don't always get a great look. Yeah, uh, it's, you know, I, I, I got it. But, yeah. you know, um, let's just say, I think the first thing, one of the first things that's an easy choice to make is somehow or other, and I don't know exactly who I'm pulling out yet for this, but Michael Roffel's got to be back in the lineup. To I completely that. agree. He's been the best player on his line in just about every game he's played i thought it was an he's often been the best player in the game yeah i, at least I thought it was Flyers. i thought it was an interesting choice to have him be the one to sit out game three and quite honestly he's the type of guy who brings a little bit of a physical edge i mean i'm not saying that this isn't <clears throat> excuse me it's like it's not i don't find it to be an overly physical series like in that sense like the islanders are being physical but they're it's a, it's a gritty four, series it's a physical four check it's not a hard hitting series it's a that grinding means, series. so i need so i need a guy in my lineup who does those things who goes into the dirty areas rags for the puck a little bit digs it out is willing to take a hit to make the play you know those things there's the I old cliche that. Yeah, but I but I need those things. And not a lot of the guys on the top six are there, either are there or are there yet. And I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Um, so he's got to come back in the lineup for me, that's for sure. So one of the things we talked about, I think, I don't know if we talked about it on the show, but I know we've texted about it in the group text, is how often we've seen Nate Thompson. And I finally figured, no, and I finally figured out why. I was just going to make a comment about Nate Thompson, but okay. I'll let you finish. No, but I, I, I figured out why. Yeah. I, my, I think my words in the group text were something about, doesn't it feel like we're hearing him so much more often? Like in terms of like, it feels like we're hearing his name He's more than we're hearing everybody else, yeah. right? And the reason for that is this. They have been putting him out there for just about every defensive zone face-off you can find. And if they don't win the face-off or don't get the clear – He's stuck on the ice, and you're seeing him. You're hearing him. You know what I mean? And Does, that's does Elaine Vigneault know that he has Claude Giroux and Sean Couturier on his team? He does, but okay. I think he's, I just wanted he's to make trying sure. to, especially – now, I don't know if it happened a lot. I actually don't remember it happening that much in game three, and maybe that's a last change thing. But he's putting him out there with first change – or with the last change in the home games – knowing that he can get him off – I guess knowing he can get him off the ice that much quicker. Only I don't know. if he wins – but I think it has to, but yeah, but well, only if he wins, but I think that I think the last change thing actually has more merit to the, he's holding Giroux Couturier for the offensive zone draws. I get it. And trying to, but it hasn't worked yet. No. You know, like it really hasn't made that much of a difference. And Thompson well, was good in, he was good in faceoffs in game two, I believe it was because they, whatever, I think it was the game that they won that he looked really good in faceoffs and they got that percentage back to some place that, made a lot of sense and and you know but like collectively i don't like their face-off percentage in this series they've lost a lot of meaningful face-offs let me ask you something i'm just thinking about how this series has played so far and you just mentioned that elaine vino is starting couturier Giroux in the offensive zone to try to get him going offensively and he's starting right. nate thompson in the defensive zone to kind of try to let those guys get a little rest I'm I'm thinking about this series and even really back into the Montreal series. Mm -hmm. The Claude Giroux and Sean Couturier lines have looked pretty decent in transition. Sure. And they're going to. And the Nate Thompson lines have looked pretty, pretty good with established offensive zone time. Yeah, I don't think you can argue that. I mean, especially. So wouldn't it make know, more sense to flip those things, right? If 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 Nate Thompson can win you draws, wouldn't it make more sense to have him try to win draws in the offensive zone, where they can then just set up, and I mean, and at the same time you get Sean Couturier in the defensive zone, and then you have Travis Konechny on the wing for transition play. Okay. Yes. And Does no. that not make sense? Okay. Yes and no. And okay. here's why. So it make everything you're saying makes sense in the okay. sense that in the sense that. 
if that's what's driving your your four check and they're controlling possession better than the other ones, then yeah, I think you want to. I definitely don't think you want to waste your top t- two lines or however they're constructed because that right. could change completely. And I'm just saying mix it in more. I'm but, not saying a but, complete but philosophy. Wanna, yeah, but you don't want to waste your top two, you know, your top six players in the defensive zone all the time, especially if they can't get that transition. Uh, for point. sure. So understood there. This is where I have, like, this is where I, you know, when, my, when I did takeaways from game three, it was where is this top six right. collectively? I'm watching, and, and I get it, you know, everybody puts the focus on Claude Drew, Captain Claude Drew. I get it. But I'm watching Sean Couturier and Kevin Hayes weekly go into the corner or get muscled off the puck really easily. I mean, Kevin Hayes is the one who's going into the corner before um, – I think it was, I don't remember if it was before Komarov's goal or before, Mar- before Matt Martin's goal in game three. Right. He's going into the corner and just lets a guy get in front of him, get that positioning and center the puck. And, no, and then obviously no one's there. But where is your presence of mind there to be hard on the puck, to be the type of player? I mean, you're the, and especially Kevin Hayes, you're the puck protector. You're right. You're, that's who, your you're thing. You're the guy who all year we marveled at. You're the guy. Who... It, it, it takes like you're such an immovable force. I've talked all season. Kevin Hayes and Jake Voracek. Good luck getting the puck off them. Right. And where right. have they been in that sense? You're not being heavy here. No. I, and I don't know what it is. I don't know if they don't want to, if they just can't, or if they don't want to, or if they're trying to be too cute. Like, I, I don't. They're definitely trying to be too cute. That right. I can answer to right off the bat. Well, right. And that's what I'm saying. And I, I want. And, I'm just saying, I don't know where it's coming from. Is Kevin Hayes coming up with that? Is somebody telling him to do that? Is where, where, where is this top six miscommunication coming from? Because it feels like they're not even on the same page, right? You're seeing missed passes. You're seeing offsides. You're seeing icing. You're seeing sloppy play out of the top six that we're just not used to. You're right. And I mean, all season, we're seeing tape to tape. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to remember where I wrote it because I wrote something about this somewhere, and I don't remember exactly where it was, but my, uh, my point to it was something of if you, maybe it was a tweet. Like, it's because I said it was a problem. Like, I even said too many of the most important players aren't showing up the way, like, or showing the will to work. Right. And you're going against a team that doesn't stop working. So it looks really bad when they don't stop. But my, I, one of my responses in, in terms of it was, is if you don't want to work and have the will to work, that's fine. You can go home in three games, you know, because this was, and, and I think I'm saying that from the sense of this is game three. You can yep. keep, you can work hard for the rest of this game, maybe find a way back in, or you can go home in two more games after this and be done with and it. Play golf. If you don't have, right, yeah. If you don't have the will to work. So that's where the frustration should be coming from first and foremost is that you, you've got to have the will to work here. And if you don't, then I don't know what you're looking for in that sense. You know what I mean? Like, I don't sure. know what you're looking for, like where you're trying to draw that from. Like w- we're looking for more from these players. Right. Why are you here? If you're not yeah, here to work? Like, honestly, and, and to talk a big game like that, you know, that, that was another thing I had mentioned earlier in the week. I think I mentioned that after game one, which is, I, you say you have another level. Show it to me. Right. Please show it to me. And I started to see hints of it. Like that, the goal. Kevin Hayes game, for the first 10 minutes of that well, game right. where he took in over. In game two. Well, and, and I don't even think, you know, we like, saw yes, some of that. Yeah. Did they have some issues? Sure, they did in that last couple of periods. But I didn't feel, you know, like I felt like Sean Couturier had a better game. I'm like, that's definitely, you know, and the second period was a very good you know, period out of him. And is it completely next level? No, and, and, and see that you're right. Because in the second period, we're watching the Islanders mostly control play possession wise, but the only way they scored a goal was on a pe- on a power play. Yep. So at five on five, you still contained them for the most part. They played a you great defensive game for a lot of that right. second period for sure. But the thing is the Islanders just keep coming. Yes. And you like at a certain point, they break you down. I, I don't, I know you're not much of a UFC guy, but I'm going to make a little <laughs> bit of a comparison here. Even very casual UFC fans know who Khabib Nurmagomedov is. The guy who okay. fought Conor McGregor a couple years right. ago, the Russian guy, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. His style is to grab you, drag you to the ground, tangle your legs up and make you tired trying to get back up. Mm-hmm. And that is how the Islanders are playing this series. 
They are dragging the flyers to the ground, punching them on the way down, tangling their legs up in ours and going, no, 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 we're playing down here. Right. And we are better than you down here. You are not winning this, period. Right. And, and the only way, so to me, the only way to beat this team, and this is where they're beatable, is, and look, execution is half of the battle because they're making a lot of self-inflicted mistakes here that, like, you got to clean it up somewhere. Yep. I mean, you've got to be a cleaner team. But nonetheless, enough with the east-west, you know, cross-ice passes where you're trying to be perfect. That's you not gotta, working against this team. You've got to take this and literally drive it up their throat and yep. say, like, we're just coming for you. And we saw that north. with success. Kevin Hayes did it. Right, straight north, and this is where it's going. And yep. if we don't push like that, then it's not going to last long. And I really don't like – one of the things I didn't want to hear, I forget – it might have been Elaine Vigneault who said it. I have to check. But I don't want to hear that the Islanders are a veteran team. They, they are by years of experience to an extent. Not with playoff experience. Well, not, not only really. that, but I don't want to hear they're a veteran team. Like, they don't have guys who have been there – like, if they have guys who have been there, done that, and won something – they're not playing right now. Right. How many like, cups are on that like, in that lineup right well, now? Well, like in here, like just well, and he just I don't know how many exactly it is or if there's any. It's to not be many. Honest. Does but Andy like, Green have one? I don't think so. No, because okay. he spent a lot of years with the Devils. So And not um, the good devils. Right. Well, he might have been there long enough that he caught the tail end of the good devils. Um no, he no, not that he long. played his entire career. I mean, he played his entire career. He just barely missed. I mean, he's got that one. I mean, he was on the cup team or the cup final team that lost to the Kings. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. So he was there for part of it. So he's got some but, experience going deep. Right. But like I look at this, I look at this team, and if you sort out the Islanders by age, strictly by age, okay? Yeah. Andy Green is 37. He's the oldest guy on the team, and he has played regularly. But yeah. then I go through the rest of the list and I go, all right, who's left? Johnny Boychuk, 36. Has he played a game yet? No. Thomas Grice, 34. Has he played yet? Uh he got some did he get some time in game oh, two? Well, game two he got time in game relief, two. But, but other, okay, he but got game, the winning game two. No, he didn't. He, no, he took didn't. the loss in game two. Like, that was the overtime game. Yeah. All right. He took the loss in game two. All right, here you go. Here's a name with some pedigree to it. Andrew Ladd, 34. Has he played in the series? I don't think so. No. Nope. Okay. How about this one for you? Now, Leo Komarov has played, scored a goal. Okay. Derek Broussard, 32. Just got into the lineup for game three, but and, sat out the first two games. Cal Clutterbuck, 32. Yeah, but they have it in the room, though. That's what they're, oh, they'll they tell you, the, right? Sure, they have it in well, the well, room. Well, we have that winning culture and that leadership off the ice and blah, blah, blah. That's what they'll tell you. Right, and I get that. But, like, what I'm trying to get at is that, like, like they're defensemen, you know, mainly a young group. They're forwards, mainly a young group. Like, Bavilia is 20, you know. <laughs> and the problem and, is, and I don't, and they're I'm, a and for, problem. For worth, yeah, and for what it's worth, those ages might not be completely accurate. Like it's, no, but Barzil's it's young. Their core is fe- young. It's as of February 1st, and I'm not going to try to do the math I right know, now. I'm like, not worried it's, about it. You know, I'm not worried about it. This is what they were at the beginning of the year, if not. So, like, let's be real about it. Like, when the season started, they were this age. All right. They're, that, they're you know? a young team. They're a younger team where than it people matters. think. Where yeah, it matters. Like, well, and, and, but they're getting – and that's, see, this is the other argument that I have when it comes to the Flyers. They're getting it from those guys. Then I go to the Flyers side, and I sit there, and I go, okay, I, like, here, here's part of it too. So let's, let's talk about the top six for a minute and the problems they've had and some of the things to keep in mind with this team, right? The oldest player on the Flyers right now is Nate Thompson <laughs> at 35. Okay. Okay? That's fine. The and he's next, fourth line minutes. He's not, not seeing a ton of ice but, time. That's but if fine. not for that trade that got him here. Wait, let me guess. Old, Who's the next oldest? Uh, it's either – is it Niskanen? At well, oh, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm stick, well, Niskanen is the next oldest player. Out, okay. Well, well not, I shouldn't say that. He's not the next oldest player if we're literally counting the whole team. Okay. Next, the next is he oldest, the next oldest regular player? No, like he's the next oldest. Player? No, he's the next oldest. We'll call it skater. Okay. Brian oh, Elliott is okay. Brian Elliott is thirty four. All right, sure, that's um, sure. But beside that, I'm st- I'm talking strictly forwards. Okay. So who's the next oldest forward? Do you think? <sighs> Probably Claude, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's Claude At Drew. Thirty two. Thirty three. Turn- he's thirty two. He'll turn thirty three in January. Okay. And this is part of where I'm trying to go with this. We put so much focus when it comes to here we go top six not producing in the playoffs again. It's Claude Giroux. That's the reason why. And Claude Giroux is the oldest one on the, of that group on the team. And the reason I bring it up is I'm not trying to sit here and make a defense for him. What I'm trying to say is, is that at some point in time during your career, when you cross over the threshold of age 30, 
you start to go from the first line guy to the second to the third. You do You've see that regression, re- yeah. The reduced role Especially comes Especially in play. recent years. We've really so, seen the NHL shift from 27 to 32 being your prime down to like 24 to 29 right. being your prime. Right. So for me, I'm going to get more frustrated and look for more in the top six. And I'm saying, when I say I need my best players to step up and I'm talking about the best players, I'm going... It's not even Claude Duro. He's he right. I'm shouldn't, going. Shouldn't be holding that mantle at this point. I'm going. Where's Sean Couturier? Fourteen. Where's Tra- Where's Travis Konechny? Where's Kevin Hayes? That's because Couturier and Hayes are in that. You know, I, I have to. I'd have to do math again. I think Hayes is twenty eight. Uh, twenty seven. Twenty eight. Yeah. And Couturier is twenty seven. And right. Konechny's twenty three. Yep. They're in the in the wheelhouse of the prime years. Even Jake Voracek is now thirty one years He's old. He's now on the veteran who contributes. Right, but see. Like, I feel like we would change the mindset if we turn around and said, okay, and let's, let's keep Kevin Hayes where he is because Kevin Hayes is the second line guy because Sean Couturier is better at his position than Kevin Hayes is. I right. think we can all agree with that. So Sean Couturier plays top line minutes. Who are you putting next to him? Travis Konechny is probably an obvious one, but then who are you putting with him? If you're going, right. it, no, like if you bump the other two who you say you're 33 or you're going to be 33 and you're 31 – we're moving you down to the second line because you're you're not right. the number one guys anymore. So who comes in? This is why Claude Drew lingers in that top line because it's probably because there's not by default. Guy. It's probably by default JVR. Or and no, I'm not no. saying it should be. No, but that's well, probably or it's or it's Dolph Araby. And there's your problem right there. See, here's the thing. Yep. Do you know who really? If you really wanted to be accurate about it from an age, it would be great standpoint. if it was Joel Faraby. No, but you know, if from an age standpoint, do you know who it really should be? Who I can put on that top line? If if like it can't be, it's not. I'm not saying this is a suggestion. I'm saying okay by age, by experience, who should slot in? Scott Tyler, Lawton. Scott Lawton. Okay. Because Scott Lawton is now 25 years old. Should be been in the league for prime. six, seven years, yep. and you like you need. That's where you want him now to be. Like. As a first round Former pick, first overall pick, or first round pick, there it is. Then, then yeah. you want to tell me. And this is where the argument that Flyers fans have when it comes to needing a scorer comes into play because Claude Giroux is not that guy, and yep. neither is Jake Voracek. And Sean Couturier and Kevin Hayes have a role as centers that make them not the guy either. People want Travis Konechny to be that guy. You know who that guy is? Go ahead. That guy's Oscar Lindblom. Mm. Fair point. That guy's Oscar Lindblom. Maybe not now. Maybe not well, right and, and this second. Can't, and it can't Obviously be, not and, right this second. But I mean, even before he went out with the diagnosis, he might not, might not have been that guy when he left. But I think if Oscar Lindblom is on this team through March, through the pause, I think he takes that spot. It's funny you should say that. And I didn't think about that at first because like my mind. Because he sure slots into it pretty nicely, on, doesn't he? Here's where my thought with Oscar Lindblom comes in. And here's the thing about him knowing he is pushing hard to try to make a return at some point, And they keep talking about September, September, September. And what's in two days, by the way, September. September. But my thought was this, you, I thought you gave a rallying cry, AV, especially when you come out and say, we got to get it there. He's working hard every day and his timeline will be his timeline. He'll tell us when he feels like, or not tell us, but we'll know when he's ready to go. But I've been told September, we've got to do our part to get there for him. And you're going to get there to an extent, but I'm not putting money on, September 1st, September 3rd, or no, September 5th. Especially I've heard when, Edmonton, right? Well, no, Once we move well, to Edmonton. Especially when the 3rd and the 5th aren't guaranteed to you yet. No. They like, are still, win they are still listed get, as if necessary. They still right. have the asterisk You know you're playing them. a game on September 1st. That's a given. And, yep. But that could very well be an elimination game for you. Yeah, he's not coming in that game. If, right. if Oscar Lindbaum's coming in the lineup, it's going to be, hopefully, theoretically, Game conference one finals. of an Eastern Conference final. Potentially. Where right. it's not an elimination game, right? And my point to – so my point to saying that is, is that that's the rallying cry. Yep. Get it to that point, and maybe he can play. And maybe he'll help you a lot. I Like, honestly, he could possibly help this team right now. He's On the he's ice. Probably, more more probably, than just a rallying cry. Right. He yeah. probably doesn't think that yet. And that's what's right. holding him out. He's going to sit there and say, I'm not close to ready yet. Man, I you don't want to play in this game because you, you I'm not going to help. About you want to talk about fresh legs. It doesn't get now, much fresher than having 10 months well, off now, at 22 now, or right, now, however well, old now, he is. He just turned 24. Uh, 24, I'm sorry. So he here's the only problem, and I think this is where he's going to tell you he's not ready. Uh, 24, huh? It's he interesting that wanna... that's, that's the age that he just turned. We just talked about that just being the opening of the prime. Here we right. go. <laughs> uh, he probably will tell you he's not ready more from the defensive standpoint too. Okay. And, and 
the speed of keeping up he with doesn't somebody want to play. He doesn't want to play with, let's say he plays with a Kevin Hayes, right? Like he's a, he goes in the second line left wing like he was before. He doesn't want to be a liability. He doesn't want to play on a line where he's got a defensive responsibility and then that line gets shredded because of it. Right. Like he doesn't want to be that guy. So Although if, if, you, case, if you put Kevin Hayes and Scott Lawton with him, those two guys can handle a lot defensively. I'm just they saying. Can. But you might not necessarily see, want a, a quote-unquote anchor on that line defensively. Well, and see, here's the thing. You, know. you have it nailed. I think you have it absolutely nailed when we, I've been sitting here going, who's the scorer? Who's the guy who you want to be that guy? Oscar. Put, put, no, but put Travis Konechny and Oscar Lindblom between, or, or on, alongside of Sean Couturier as your top line and, tr- and say, you know, go ahead and fly, right? Yep. And then you're and – then, and I don't know if I love Kevin Hayes with Claude Giroux per se. No. Um, you know what? Defensively, it's, it's still it's pretty like, good. Right. But here's the thing. That's, you it, know oh, what? It's that, not pretty good defensively. But see, can I you, can, can you could, turn you that into Scott your Lawton shutdown? There. Could you turn that into your shutdown line and just put all three of them there? And just try. God, it's so hard without last change, though. Like, if you do that in game right. five, I think, okay, they're not going to hear what we have to say for game four by game four anyway. So let's talk about game five. <laughs> right. <laughs> you put those three together for game five. You get last change. There you go. Boom. Your top line, Matt Barzell, whoever's playing with Matt Barzell, here you right. go. Deal with Sean Couturier, Claude Giroux, or I'm sorry, uh, Kevin Hayes, Claude Giroux, and Scott Lawton. Have fun winning that faceoff. Well, can we, make, can we make the point that you just brought up Matt Barzell, and he hasn't scored a goal yet in the series, and this team has combined for, what, 12 goals, or you know, almost 12 goals, 11 goals? He hasn't done anything particularly 10 goal, special. 10. They're at 10. They're at three, in the, three in game three, three in game two, and four in game one. And he hasn't scored a goal. He hasn't done anything particularly special, really. Like, he's well, looked okay. The, see, and this is, where part of the, this is where part of the top six argument comes in for the Flyers also, is that you used to be able to take this throughout the year as the Couturier line's really going, but I'm not getting a lot from Kevin Hayes right now. Or, boy, you know, that Kevin Hayes line is looking really good, but where's the, where the, top, th- the top three? Where's Claude Giroux? Where's you? And you're allowed to be – like, you can be okay with it. You can live with it. I can live with – I honestly, for the round robin, you can live with Sean Couturier not scoring a goal during the round robin when everybody else is doing their part, when right. everybody else looks good, but you can't let everybody go quiet at the same time. You won't win. Okay, I, I have a little bit of a, a radical suggestion for you. Okay. Claude Giroux, third line center. I think, see, I think that that's realistic down the road. Like, it's not realistic now because well, the well, fact here's, that you here's what I'm saying. there, but. Well, here's what I'm saying is, is one of the reasons we heard about why he's not going to play center much anymore is that he doesn't want that kind of ice time, that defensive responsibility, that sort of like heavy duty defensive role. Right. Third line cuts your minutes a mm-hmm. little bit. Uh, he'll still play power play one and blah, blah, blah. And probably on the penalty kill and, but you send him down there, then you're solid down. You have three of the best face-off guys in the league going Couturier, right. Giroux down the center. I think at a certain point, you need to attack the Islanders somewhere. And going at their top six is not working. So you got to deepen something. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Do you think there's yeah. any, any validity to, to deepening the Flyers' attack a little bit by putting Claude Giroux on the third line? I mean, it's, it's tough. So here's the problem I have with that suggestion at the moment, and that is I really don't want to, in the middle of the playoffs, bury – what would that be? Bury $15 million – on the third line because they're both better like what because they might be able to score more when i put them on the top power play but not in you know at five on five i need other play drivers at five on five and i don't i just don't feel like there's a set like this team doesn't have like Lindblom might be the closest thing they have coming up to a pure goal score because 11 goals in 30 games is pretty darn good yeah you're roughly on pace for a 30 or 30 goal season right off the bat probably a little more yeah, and if that's and and, and he was and he's only going to get better. It was only his third year in the league, so right, exactly. He's only going to get he's better. Still... The problem I have, see, and see, here's here's the problem I have with that statement to an extent is he could be that guy. I mean, he went he had 17 goals a year ago, and he was going to completely smash that to a million pieces this year if if everything didn't happen. Obviously, um, it still fuels the argument that they need another guy who can just do that because of the fact that you know, like. 
people want Claude Giroux right now, and this is why people are everybody's with the scratch the captain, blah blah blah, like all that type of stuff. People are like that because they want Claude Giroux to be Nathan McKinnon. They want Claude Giroux to be Connor McDavid. They want him to be Sidney Crosby, and not even on the all-world level. They want him to be the takeover guy, the guy who just completely runs a game. And my answer to that is that that's not Claude Giroux, and it's I'm not saying that's not Claude Giroux in the sense of his role. I'm saying I want Travis Konechny to be the takeover guy. Where's he? You know, how come we're not putting heat on him? I want Sean Couturier to be the takeover guy. He's just got all the tools do, in my book. Sure, but... I, I do too to an extent, but like – I want Sean Couturier to do what Ryan O'Reilly did for the Blues last year. That's, That's what I want. That's – he gets all the comparisons. He's in the Selkie conversation. He's blah, blah, blah. You're 27. You're not 22 in the defensive guy anymore. Right. You're 27. Back-to-back 30-goal seasons before this season got cut off, you were yeah, a little below that pace, but not terribly so. And I almost feel like, you know – It's time to go. Here's and here's something, and, and I'm again, I'm not trying to make defenses or, or do, but for comparison's sake, like let's let's play this card for a minute. People think that Claude Giroux should be a better playoff performer because of one shift he had against Pittsburgh. Like he has one shift. And it was a great knocks, shift. No, but hold on, he knocks the best player in the world on his ass on the first shift of the game with authority in a yep. game where you feel felt like you had to have it because you'd already you're two thirds of the way to blow in a three zero series lead. Yep. And he, and he goes out there and goes, I want the first shift. He's not the captain yet, by the way. So he goes, I want the first shift, puts the best player in the world on his ass in the first 10 seconds of the game. He was the de facto captain. Then Pronger was gone, and we all knew he was getting And then circles back, and 20 seconds later, scores a goal. Bar down, slams against the board. Off and running, fired up, let's go, game on. I believe there was another word between let's and go there, but we'll save that from the radio. (laughs) Right. Sean Couturier against the same team in the playoffs. The same year. No, not the same year. Oh, no, not the same year. Okay. Goes out and on one leg puts up five points and also scores a clutch goal to keep their season alive the game before that. So four goals and two assists in a matter of 62 minutes of game time. It's pretty good. Realistic, because it was under two minutes to go in game five. Scores a goal on one leg that wins the game and then scores three and, and has two assists. Factors into every goal you scored in the next game, which ends up being the eliminator, but does it anyway. That's the takeover level that people expect from the top guys. They want yeah. – somebody wants and, – and, and, like, in, in fairness, not to fuel – again, not to fuel a Claude Giroux argument, but we're sitting here watching the first period. I'm, I'm with a couple friends last night. We're watching the first period of Vegas-Vancouver after the Flyers is over, and Zach Whitecloud scores, and someone turns around and goes, Who's Who? that? Yeah. And I turn and I said – I understand you're asking who, but that guy has three more goals and the same number of points as Claude Drew does in this year's playoffs. So figure it, like figure that one out for me. Uh, yeah, like there's like, really not much. Total there. unknown to most people. Nope. And the Flyers. I knew who, I knew who he was, but I'm a hockey nerd, so like I don't. Well, know. exactly. Yeah. And I'm watching with people who don't sit down and watch every team all the time, like I do. And yet here's a guy who just scored his third goal of the playoffs, and you're going, "How many goals does Claude Drew have again? How about, how about this? How many goals does Sean Couturier have again?" So how this team has a reputation on this show for putting news out right after the show ends for, for making our shows irrelevant immediately. <laughs> you just Sean Couturier around. has a hat trick tonight, right? Oh, jeez! Like it's just, it just has to happen. Like this show is going to drop probably right around eight o'clock. <laughs> the puck is going to drop. Right around eight fifteen. No, you know, you know. Sean Couturier will have three goals by nine. You know what? I remember a game against Montreal way back early in the year. Maybe no, the November game, the Provorov goal game. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. How we remember it. I turn around and I'm watching the game, and I turn. And I sit there and I say, "Boy, Ke- Kevin Hayes looks like." And I use an alternative word for crap. Okay. okay. Yeah. And I turn around and literally I said it, and five seconds later he scored to tie the game, or yeah, tie the game. That's about right. And I'm like, and I'm like, go figure. I called them out and now we did something like, you know, what am I supposed to say to that? You know what I mean? Uh, well, listen, then this show is going to serve as a hell of a tray for these boys to step it up and prove what they got. Well, uh, you have to now. I mean, let's put it this way. If they don't win this game tonight, we're on here next week telling you the season's over. Uh, it, it's just fact. If we're out of here tonight, there might be a special show on Wednesday for an in memoriam (laughs) because that'll just be the end of it, right? Like, I don't see this team going down 3 1 unless there's a miracle, unless Alain Vigneault channels 
every great coach from uh, every sports history. Right. I don't see this team coming back 3-1 on a, on a Barry Trotz-led team that's just this good defensively. And, he, and here's the thing about, about them collectively, okay? Go back and look at all the games so far. 4 nothing is as bad as it looked. It could have been worse, quite honestly. It was a miracle it was one nothing after two periods. Let's be real about that. Yes. The game three <laughs> final score of 3-1 to one can be masked as a good, solid effort where you gave up an empty netter at the end, couldn't solve the goalie, whatever. It can be masked like that. And we, we know all know that's not, not the case. No, we, and we know it's not, but that's, you know, you know, I got it. But like at the same time, like, like it just bothers me how, like, I'd rather, like I, I said, like I sat there last week and I said, oh, I think on Sunday when we come on after game four, after four games have been played, it'll be two, two. And the reason I said that was because I thought you were going to get two, you know, four really hard fought games, very much like game two was. And you win a couple and you lose a couple because it's that close between. Because it's teams. hockey and you get it's some bounces. Playoff and, hockey, right. it is what it is. You know what I mean? All right. There's a bounce right. a call. Right. Right. So, um, like, that's where I'm at with that. Like, I thought that was what we'd get. And so far, I've watched two Islander wins that haven't looked like that at all. And the Flyers yeah. are going to probably have to earn, if they win in game four to get it to 2 2, it's probably going to have to be earned the same way that game two was. And here's the problem like, the problem with game two is very simple. When you went up three nothing in the first period, and even though you opened the door with that um, with that power play goal they scored in the second period slightly, you came into a third period knowing that all you had to do was probably finish the job off the way that you did in the round robin games. So just lock it down. Lock it down. And the first time you gave up a transition rush, you got you got beat. And I don't like I real I don't love putting it on goalies. I wanted Carter Hart to make a save you there. Want a save there. And, and here's the thing. Carter Hart made a better save, in my opinion, in game three on the 2 on 0 that Beauvillier gets. And he makes a better save there on one that you think Fantastic that's going – like on one that I'm sorry. I thought as I was watching it going, that's going in. I had already rolled my eyes and went, right. oh, I already oh, here went, we go. well, here it goes. Yep. And, and Start and thinking we, about yeah, what you're going to tweet out from at Flyer Delphia. Right. And, no, and, we already, and we all acknowledge at the same time as we're watching it what a huge save that is because obviously that's one that you think is going in. And that's, that's one – that's one that if you go down the ice and score 30 seconds later, that's a boom. That's one of those sure. saves. And this is the thing about uh, – maybe this is the thing about Carter Hart to an extent. The, I wonder if this team sometimes thinks that they can do whatever the hell they want to. Because, because they have such a there. reliable like, goalie back there. Yeah. Like, here's the thing. And I've been asked this question a lot because when as soon as it was brought into the picture that there was back-to-backs in the playoffs – it, it's been asked, who's and the goal? About it. Like we, and we've talked about it. Here's my answer to an extent, all right? Because I don't know what's really going to happen. And we won't know. I, I guarantee you I won't know the answer until about 7.30 tonight. I think we see Hart tonight. Okay, so that's what I think as well because I think that no, you have no choice. Like To me, the only way you were going to Brian Elliott was if you were up 2-1 to one and you wanted to try to get by for game three. Right, we for, talked for, about this for the, three, one the Montreal win. series too. Right. right. Here's the real answer, though. I almost wonder, because Brian Elliott's played against the Islanders twice this year. Okay. And both times, the Flyers could have won those games. Okay, they lost both, obviously, in the regular season. But here's, here's the deal with that. They had Brian – I believe – I have to double-check that. I believe it was Brian Elliott in goal for that November game where they led 3 nothing and blew <laughs> the lead. That sounds familiar. But then didn't win it in overtime. They lost oh, okay. it in a shootout. And then he was definitely the guy in goal because everybody remembers that for the one that they fell behind three nothing, worked the whole game to come back, tied it with about a minute and a half left, and then lost it with about forty seconds left. Right. But my, my thing is, I think it's Carter Hart's crease until he gives you a reason, until he he tells you, or until he shows you. And right now, if Carter Hart wants to play tonight, I think Carter Hart plays tonight. Because I don't disagree. It, it, because in that crease. He has not shown you that he can't win you games. Right. And here's, and here's the thing. Obviously, the, the key difference between the Montreal series and this series is that, yes, there's not really a superstar guy yet on the Islanders. I think there's guys who could be. And look, don't, like, here's the thing. Anders Lee is playing like an Dude, all-star I'm, right now. I'm sick of Anders Lee. Yeah. And As a Flyers be. fan, I'm sick of Anders Lee. And you should be because he's, the, he's been the flyer killer in the series to this point. Yep. And Barzil's going to be a superstar in the league down the road. Yep. Like if he, you know, he's working his way towards it. I don't think he's there yet. And I say he's not there yet because of the fact that to me, he's not the first guy who comes up in conversations when you talk about the best in the league. That's he's, why I'm not including him. He's I, the best player on this team. Bar I'm not. convinced that the only reason he's not in that conversation is because of the Barry Trotz's defensive system. 
quite possibly. I mean, but if, anyway. he, if, if he would be able to see, and this is the thing, if in that defensive system, especially since, he's, no, but especially since he's so young, he's only 22, 23, you know, right. since he's so young, give him two or three years. If he can in that defensive system, not only be that like still in that age range, but go from 60 points in a season to 85 to 90. Now you're talking about something. Now you're talking about a point per game guy. And now we talk about defensive system. Yeah. Right. Now he's a, now he's a superstar and he's on his way to that, I think. But that being said, they don't have a guy, but you know, when they played, when the Flyers played the Canadians, if Nick Suzuki couldn't score and Max Domi couldn't score and Jesperi Cookney, I mean, all these guys, by the way, all these guys who are under 25, I believe. Oh uh, yeah. Montreal is a problem for a while. You yeah. know, to the point where you're, you're relying on, I'm not kidding when I say this, when you're relying on Tomas Tatar and Shea Weber to be your offensive power forces, because the rest of it is kids, literally kids. Yeah. Children, you know, I mean, for God's almost sake, I mean, children. Like look at their fourth line at times too. I mean, like, like their fourth line has Dale Weiss on it. <sighs> you know what I mean? Like, not, like Arturi Lekkinen was a nice little player and Philip Dano is a nice little player and Paul Byron's a nice little player and they're great depth guys for a I lot think of Dano is a little more than a nice little player, but I get what you're saying. Well, no, but, but I'm saying, I, on yeah. most of the good teams, they're depth guys. Yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not like, that's what I mean by that. Like, I'm sorry, Philip Dano is not a first line center. No, that's fair. He, you, he might pass as a second line center and he's probably a third line center on a team like Colorado or Dallas or something like, you know what I mean? Like one of those or Vegas or, you know, whatever, like they, that's what you can get away with. So when those handful of kids aren't powering your scoring, like we saw Nick Suzuki do in game five of that series, or like we saw, um, trying to figure out who else, you know, like others like that, but Kokaniemi had two goals in game two, Yep. you know, okay. When they're not powering your offense, good luck. And that made it easier for Carter Hart to be lock it down myself, get the defensive held to lock it down, win a couple, you know, win a one, nothing and two, nothing shutout. Right. That makes it more possible. It's not going to be possible against Anders Lee, Anthony Bavillier, Matt Barzell. Right. There, Um, there's nobody. I don't know if there's any, right. They're just a deeper team. Sure. Montreal probably has a better top six. You know, Montreal probably has more talent in their top six than New York does. I don't see. I don't agree with that at all. I think they have more. I think they have more potential talent. Let's put it that uh, way. Maybe, maybe so. Like they have more star power potential in their top six than see, I think the, weird the part Islanders about, do. The weird part about the Islanders top six to me is that, like, look, Anders Lee has played like the all star he has been in in the past in this series. Right. And then you know, Bavillier is gr- continuing to grow and has got a lot of potential. So does Barzil. Yeah. Jordan Eberle is a great fit for that team somehow. And I, I there were somehow times where, no, like I'm saying, because there were times where I didn't see it. Like right. I think he's molded over the two years or three years he's been there. Like the first year he, he was shaped there, his game remember. there. But the first year he was there, I don't remember him being that good. No, and he definitely wasn't great in Edmonton. Like I he, think Barry he, Trotz has made a little bit of a project, right? Like, him. like I feel like Eberle is is what you know, like when when, when we were early in the year talking about Jake Voracek's bought into the defensive side of Elaine Vigneault's system. That's Jordan Eberle with Barry Trotz. That's right. here's a guy who wants to score a ton of goals who had to be reeled in. You got to rein it in a little bit. Like, don't go crazy with that. They'll come. The goals will come. The points will come play this style first. And he's bought in. And I think he's that key guy for them. And then who else? Am I, I mean, Brock Nelson was, should have been an all-star this year. I think, or was he? I don't remember if he was. I, he I, been. I he was in the final vote. I remember that. And I said, I, I liked this game a lot. And, and then Josh Bailey's in there too. And these are guys who, like I said, I don't think people go crazy. Like people don't get up and go crazy when you see, you know, Brock Nelson, Josh Bailey on, on that top six. No. It's it, it, that's why I said it's not a sexy lineup, but it doesn't have to be. They just go out and they work hard and they win. Yeah, and they have and certainly. Then, and then oh by the way, you, and then oh by the way, at the deadline you make a trade and John Gabriel Pajot is your third line center. It's pretty good. Like holy crap, your third line center is a guy who scored four goals in a playoff game once. Yeah. And for, who, for a t- for and a who was that, on a tear in the early but, portion of this season, too. Well, right, but and for a team that after that playoff run went to the, straight to the bottom of the league. Yep. Like, honestly, yeah, it's crazy. And that's, and that's the type of stuff to me that fuels the argument that the Flyers need to go out and get a guy who, like, and, like, this is where people are going to – no, people are going to sit there and go yeah. – because, because I think the, the message was – that was what JVR was supposed to be. That's what Ron Hextall signed JVR to be was look at a guy who scores 30 something goals, 
check that off the list. Like I'm getting a goal scorer and I spent the money on a goal scorer. And the problem is, is that we all knew what JVR's game kind of was already. We knew power play specialist and we knew like, and then when your power play is not going, then obviously he's not scoring goals. Right. You know what I mean? Like he, he and then really the problem like, is the problem is the rest of the team got good enough around him that he's not even always on the first power. Right. Like, I, like <laughs> out of my own curiosity, I pulled up the free agency list and the first like went and sorted it by goal scored strictly goals, not points. Like I'm not, yeah. cause they've got enough guys who can put up points. Yeah. We're just looking for, you know, put the best get in the basket. And realistically, you're not going to find a guy who's like, who's like this. Like you're not like, honestly, go back, like go back to the Johnny Gaudreau trade rumors. If, you, if you're going to try to know, if you're going to try to find a guy who has more than that, like, cause here's the best, cause, cause listen to me. Here's the best guy. Here's the best guy on the list. The highest goal scorer on the list has that's a, that's a pending free agent has 29 goals. Who do you think it is? Pending free agent, 29 goals, uh, 29 goals this season. Yes. Okay, so it's not Taylor Hall. No, it's not Taylor Hall. Taylor Hall only had 16 uh, goals. Alex year. Petrangelo. N- no, that's actually not a bad guess, though. Petrangelo okay. had 16 as well. And okay. that's, that's, t- that's saying a lot as a defenseman, too. So, like, I'm, yeah. try- I'm, I'm looking for forwards. All right, who is possibly it? Possibly slotted. It's Mike Hoffman. <laughs> okay. Now, no, but see, so here's the He's problem. He's going to get paid too much this summer. Well, he is, but here's the problem. What, when I think of Mike Hoffman, well, I think some, no, you know what I mean. No, but I think the same thing of James and Reamsek to an extent. Not he's a better version of James and Reamsek, but again, a guy who you need to unleash that shot on the power play right. to really get him going to, most to times. get value out of that contract. I'd love to go back and like if I go in and I look, and I, I should try to look him up really fast just to see because I'd love to see how many overtime goals he has and how many power play goals he had this year. Okay, because both should be a, a high number to me. Like he's. That's what they use him for the most. So let's see. This year, he had 29 goals, 18 were even strength, 11 were power play. It's about right. Okay. He had three game-winning goals, which means – so I, actually, that means in overtime, he did not contribute near as much as I would think then because okay. g- game winners don't have to be overtime. And if he only had three in a year like, – th- like last year, he had six when he was the last – one of the last years – his okay, his second to last year with Ottawa, which I think that was the, uh, the Ottawa year where – um. They went to the conference final, right? But, 2017. Uh, was the year they went to yeah. The conference final. Yeah, because eight, then Pittsburgh had, played Nashville. Yeah, he had eight game winners that year Whew. in the regular season, right? Wow. So, like, that's what he was that particular year. That 2017 so, Ottawa team was crazy. So to me, so to me, the next mo- and again, I, he, he, this is not a guy I define as a pure goal scorer, but this is the next most attractive name on the list is Evgeny Dadinov. Man, he's gonna be. He's going to sign a four-year deal somewhere or a, fo- a five-year and deal somewhere, and he's old, all, and, and then Seattle's going to pick him. You ready? Yeah, that's, well, how, then, that's how Evgeny Dadunov's career is going to go. Right, and here's, the, and here's the thing. I'm not saying go sign Evgeny Dadunov. I'm saying no. I went to go look to see just out of here because, again, he, there's two problems the Flyers face here. One, they probably could use a guy like this. Two, yeah. you're paying – Eight eight point two five million dollars to Claude Giroux, eight and a half to Jake Voracek, seven to James Van Riemsdyk, seven point one four to Kevin Hayes. Andrew How McDonald much more money do you have this year? Well, I don't care about Andrew <laughs> coming off the books because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, they probably still don't have six million dollars to spend on some As far as I'm concerned, you not, put not when you have to re-sign Sean Couturier down the road. We have to re-sign Sean Couturier down the road. Carter Hart needs a contract after next season. Right. It's I mean, time to start thinking about these things. I'm not saying, you know, you can't do anything this summer, but right. Uh, you know, uh, Robert Hag is minor, but he's coming up soon. You know, a lot of guys, Travis Sanheim, I think signed a two year deal. Is that up at the end I, of this year? Sanheim? Yeah. Uh, it's next year. So it's next year. So you do yeah, still get one more year. You got another year of him, yeah. man. You got to I mean, extend him this off season. Well, like, let's just, wait. just, just out of, so here's, here's what comes off the books going into next year that like, I think you can bank yeah. on a little more than likely Nate Thompson's $1 Gone. million. Bye. Uh, Justin Braun's $3.8 million. Gone. Um, possibly, unless you can work out a more friendly deal, possibly Brian Elliott's 2 million. I'd like to resign Brian Elliott for one point two or something something in okay, that realm right. is a nice little now, backup the rest, by the way the restricted free agents you have to sign this year this is a rough list if you're look like this is a rough one because like the list is players who are going to want a little more because they did a little more well this is going to be nolan isn't it well nolan patrick's one of them uh phil myers robert haig and nick Aubey kubel man phil myers is a tough one now and phil myers by the way is making under seven hundred thousand yep. dollars right now to the, toward oh, the cap anyway. Obey Kubel is not going to get more than what two, two and a half in a, in a flat cap world. He'll get two or three years at right around two million, right? 
yeah. I imagine. Uh, in a world where we know the cap is staying flat for three years, I think a lot of players are going to go bridge. Right. So teams don't have that money for the big six year, $9 million, blah, blah, blah. You can't do this year what you did with Provorov and Konechny last year. You just can't go six years on. Right. So like, all right, so here we go again. So like uh, back to what I was trying to tell you, uh, say about the, mon- the money again. Right, right, right. So Claude Drew was two eight point two seven five, and we're already Jake, doing a post show, huh? Right, a season show. Oh man! And then and Jake Voracek is eight point two five, so I, I had that a little off. Kevin Hayes is seven point one four. James Ernstike is seven. To stick to the top six conversation, Travis Konechny is five point five million. Sean Couturier is four point three three million. These are the guys that make the most money on this team. It's, and yep. James Van Riemsdyk aside, because yes, he's a power play specialist that goes into a sheltered third line role because he, we know he's not the most defensive player. Right. Understood. So Scott Lawton's the guy who we've vaulted in there, so to speak, or your, or again, like the Joel Farabee thing. Joel Farabee is being asked to do a whole hell of a lot at 20 years old with no playoff experience to be a guy who you think is going to contribute that way. Yep. And then by the way, oh, and see, oh, by the way, who's that alternative that you gave me who fits into that top six? Oscar, who now will be making three million dollars next year. That contract who, 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 who perfectly, by the way, slots into seventh among your forwards. Perfect. No, so he so, will no, be a value so now. In your top, top six. seven. No, so now your top seven is those six guys. So Limblom, Couturier, Konechny, Hayes, Voracek, Drew, and James Interim's like playing next on the third line. Yep. So there's your clear cut top seven guys by money who you need to produce to be successful. Yep. And you and and see that and this is the problem. Good luck adding somebody when you have that much money committed. I mean, how much money is that committed to the cap, cap already? That's that's already seventy two point five million dollars committed to a cap of eighty one point five. The Flyers are playing snug with the cap, and we all know it. And and right, uh, there's a little bit of money that the Flyers retained on Gudis that falls off at the end of the year. The Gudis money falls off. The McDonald money does not. Oh, I'm sorry. McDonald's there's one, one more year at McDonald, but and it drops. Right? It goes from one point. No, it goes up. It, it goes, goes from up. Like it goes up to almost to one point five. It, no, it goes right. up to 1.9. 1. 1.9, 1. 9, wow. Yeah, it's almost the, – the money that drops is – Thanks, way, Amac. No, do you remember – I mean, I'm sure, like, everybody remembers the David Schlemko buyout, right? Uh, yeah, right. Okay, well, that drops from 900000 to 600000 Sure so glad we used a buyout of, on David Schlemko. No, I'm glad they did, though, because they needed to free up a, one of the contract the spaces. I know. You know, I mean, that, that's the only way you get Joel Farabee and Morgan Frost playing at the same time – like, at right. the same time at one point in time, I'm sure, like – I like, I don't know. Is there, you know, and, and one, and by the way, so in addition to Nate Thompson, like I said, possibly coming off the books, you have um, Tyler Pitlick and Derek Grant who are also UFAs. Yeah. Um, which are, which are tough sells. So you know like, what? where do you do? This is a little too pessimistic for my taste. Yeah, I know. Uh, the I Flyers mean, haven't even four. lost yet. Uh, game four is tonight. Uh, we were going to touch on the rest of the league, but we kind of ran out of time a little bit here. Uh, Real quick, like, well, real we can, quick, we, we touched on series results really quick. We, I mean, we, we, we touched on about, Tampa, Boston, and the fact did. that Tampa's up three one, and Boston kind of looks done. Uh, going out west, uh, Vegas and Vancouver cannot have a close hockey game. <laughs> Pretty much, <laughs> they're blowing um, each other out, and it's alternated every game so far. Uh, Vegas game, is up two one. That series has gone just about as I thought. I said Vegas in six for that series. That's gone just about as I thought it would. Honestly, like, I, I Vancouver's think Vegas had that showing. I think but, Vegas is going to put their foot on the pedal here, and and Vancouver might slip one more out if Markstrom stands on his head. But I, I think they're kind of done. And then uh, Colorado Dallas is finally a series because Colorado won Game Three to make it two one. Dallas jumped out to a two nothing lead there, and I think that surprised a lot of people in that series. Okay, more surprising than that. Dallas should have won game three. Dallas should have won game three. They, they go on that roll. And, I, and, and, and granted, I, after the Flyers won game two in overtime, um, you know, I stopped. I didn't watch any more games for the rest of the day because I didn't feel like it. Um, no, I but, get it. No, but um, th- I saw that it was getting crazy. And the fact that Dallas, halfway through the third period, had scored, I guess it was at that point, they'd scored four unanswered goals or five unanswered goals. Something yeah, four like that, yeah. It was four unanswered goals because they were up four or something like that. Um, no, I'm sorry. It was 3-1 Colorado uh, in, after the second period. So it's 3-1, and you think Colorado is going to put that shutdown mode on and, and continue to pile on, by the way, possibly. Like they do. Right. Right. And then it's – here. Oh, oh, by the way, the breakout player of the playoffs. That Gary is Gurionov. Is like just coming ah, out of – It just comes in and starts it all off. 
And then, you know, and then Blake Como ties it, who, who, who you don't think is going to score. Jamie Dennis Gurionov is channeling a little bit of Vili Leno. Yeah, he's really having a thing, having a, having a playoff here. And then, you know, and then all of a sudden, here comes Colorado's guys. And it's, you know, it's Miko Ranton and tying it up it's almost right ones. away afterwards. And, you know, and then you get, you know, another one quick from Kadri and, and play it out from there. But to be 5-4 going down the stretch, I mean, it was just – hellacious play back and forth that's that is crazy that is a series that you know i mean if you can stay up till 11 30 12 o'clock those are some fun hockey games better yet and i mean by the time this is by the time this is out everybody will have not heard this yet by this point but it's the precursor this is the setup to the flyers islanders game four it's at six so if you can i'm gonna be yes if you can get entertain yourself with this one try to because you know now now for, now for what you're saying yes game five on monday night is 9 45 after the after probably yeah. after tampa eliminates boston in game five um but um i'm a little disappointed with that one too i mean i did i did pick tampa to win so i'm not disappointed about that part of it but i really thought we were getting a seven game series out of that one it feels like anything but but if um, any team's coming back it's boston so i'm not right, ready to count I mean, them out yet Let's this way. I, I did. I'm a little. I was definitely surprised that Dallas has been as competitive as they've been in all three games because of the fact that I said I said Colorado in six, thinking, oh, you know, they'll make it a series a little bit, and then right. they'll win Game Five to force it to six, and then it'll be over. Colorado's got to win three out of the last four games to make this happen. That series is going to be real spicy, and we're going to get to watch uh, Game Four, like you said tonight, before the Flyers play yeah, Game and, Four. And I'm sure that next week we'll have way more on these other series. We'll have way especially, more on everything, because well, especially knowing, like, yeah. if we know that we'll know conference final matchups, yeah. we'll know where we're going, we'll know the, the Edmonton situation. However, we'll know who's in, we'll know what the deal with the Flyers yep. season is, we'll know it all, and we will know. All of that next week. So make sure to come back and join us here. Uh, We generally release shows Sunday at 8 p.m. with live shows kind of sprinkled here throughout the playoffs. Uh, In the meantime, you can find announcements about those live shows on our Twitter. We're at YWT Podcast. Don't forget to follow Kevin at Kevin underscore Durso. He's also over at Flyer Delphia and at Sports Talk PHL. You can find the show everywhere. We're on iTunes. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We're on YouTube. We're on sportstalkphilly.com where you can find the, uh, the episodes every week. And uh, until next time, Kevin, you good? Anything you need to say? No, nope. let's just uh, hopefully we have good things to talk All right, about. Then. Flyers and seven. All right. <laughs> See you guys. See you. <laughs> Ah! <laughs>